to Texas Heart Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. The topic of today's presentation is artificial intelligence in cardiovascular medicine, current status and what does the future hold? I'm Zvonimir Krajer. I'm an international cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in Houston, Texas. Joining me today is uh, Dr. William Kahn, or Billy Kahn. Uh, he's a cardiovascular surgeon and vice president of Johnson & Johnson Medical Device Companies and executive director at the Center for Device Innovation at Texas Medical Center. He's also a professor of surgery at Baylor College of Medicine, as well as an adjunct professor of bioengineering at Rice University and also at the University of Houston in Houston, Texas. Exactly. Another expert that's joining me today to this, uh, in, this, in this program is Mehdi Rezavi. He's a director of electrophysiology clinical research and innovations at Texas Heart Institute. He's also an associate professor in Baylor College of Medicine and also adjunct professor of bioengineering at Rice University. He's a cardiologist and electrophysiologist at Texas Heart Institute and CHI Health Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in Houston, Texas. Welcome, gentlemen, to this program. Thank you. I do not have any disclosures related to this presentation. And also, Dr. Kahn doesn't have any conflict of interest, and Dr. Rezavi doesn't report any conflict of interest related to this presentation. Now, to understand a little bit better about artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is an attempt to explore the architecture of human brain to perform tasks that conventionally were not able to be resolved with the standard algorithms uh, uh, in this uh, field. It's an attempt to mi mimic cognitive uh, function of human brain in the process of learning and problem solving understanding speech and strategy and uh, many other aspects. The important thing about uh, uh, artificial intelligence and efforts and goals is to be able to better uh, collect the data with an effort to improve accuracy of diagnosis in cardiovascular medicine. Also, it offers the opportunity for early detection of disease and also the prediction of outcomes. Also, the benefits could be increase in access of quality of care and better disease surveillance and timing of intervention, as well as to uncover novel associations between data and disease and to reduce human errors, as well as the decreased cost of medical care and also improvement in uh, imaging such as uh, equipment performance, uh, adding new algorithms as far as imaging is concerned, and improvement in uh, techniques. We also hope that this could add to improvement in professional data sharing, either in publications or presentations or in statistical analysis. Uh, there are uh, many, many companies that are exploring this uh, option. And one is uh, this particular one, uh, IDXDR, uh, it's an AI diagnostic system that can autonomously analyze images of retina for signs of uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy. And this is very important in early diagnosis. There are a huge number of patients with diabetes that are at risk of developing diabetic retinopathy and uh, progression of it to uh, blindness. And we can identify diabetic neuropathy, uh, retinopathy in very early stages uh, outside of the spectrum of specialists. I think it would be a great uh, benefit uh, to the society. So this can be used in a primary care setting without any expert interference or observation or performing the procedure. And this particular technique can very accurately establish the presence of uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy with, as we can see, with very high sensitivity, specificity, and imageability. 
And then uh, if the diagnosis is established, the primary care physician can refer a patient to a diabetic uh, retinopathy specialist that can address this and treat it in early uh, stages of this disease. There are many other examples that we can share with you. And one of them is a very common one uh, that occurs uh, relatively frequently in interventional field. And this is a progression of a renal functional impairment. Uh, let's take a typical scenario of uh, uh, performing a diagnostic angiogram in a patient that has a moderately impaired renal function. And that contrast load obviously can uh, lead to a worsening of the renal function either on a temporary or permanent basis. And uh, it would be extremely helpful to know and predict whether any particular patient in this situation would uh, end up with ATN and might require um, additional hospitalization. So this particular algorithm can uh, predict uh, worsening of the renal failure on the basis of uh, obtaining serum creatinine on day one and day two after the procedure and predicting how high is creatinine going to rise and whether this is going to re lead to ATN. And this has been uh, reported uh, in the literature as well. Here are uh, uh, another, here's another very useful example that I was directly involved with and that is related to the use of AI in clinical research and uh, publications. Billy, you mentioned the uh, IBM Watson computer as uh, one of the mega computers that can help us in, in many different areas uh, uh, in evaluation and treatment of patients with cardiovascular diseases. We wanted to determine in this particular scenario, uh, what happens uh, as far as complications are concerned with the use of large bore arterial sheets during various kind of uh, interventions such as EVAR, TVAR, and TAVAR. And we wanted to compare it with the surgical access and repair of femoral arteries in this subset of patients. Now, uh, as I mentioned, our particular interest was in this population of patients. But uh, to analyze real life uh, experience in this type of scenario, surgery versus uh, uh, endovascular repair of the access site uh, uh, is an important thing. And uh, we, for this particular reason, uh, implored uh, IBM Watson Explorers uh, data system with IBM Watson Health. And the reason for it is we wanted to get objective analysis in a huge number of uh, patients without introducing bias and uh, finding comparative uh, group of uh, individuals that either had a surgical or endovascular repair of the access site. So we were able with Watson computer analysis to actually search longitudinal data among 55 million US patients that underwent those type of procedures between 2012 and 2017. Now this would have been impossible to do without computer access and analysis of our data. If I could just add some, Svanko, you know, now that's being done prospectively. There are companies, startup companies, that are focusing on using AI to identify patients to enroll prospectively in trials. And one such company, Deep Six, that uses AI machine learning and, and uh, um, was brought in. There was a drug study. The Texas Medical Center wanted to be involved. They uh, went combed through medical records and only came up with two patients that met the criteria. Deep Six, when hooked to the online medical record, identified 46 patients in two hours. Uh, <clears throat> what we did is uh, we used Watson IBM sister, which was uh, in a lot of instances, actually, for educational purposes, could be free of charge, which a lot of uh, scientists uh, are not aware of it. But this computer can analyze uh, language pattern, so it can do language processing, image recognition, including tone analysis and deep machine learning, which is very important. It also has a Watson avatar, 
that can guide you through the steps uh, how to design the data analysis. And it can also perform cognitive computer computing technology as far as text mining is concerned. What is also very important, and that was useful to us to look at the EMRs of those patients, Watson has access to 90 different servers with combined data storage of over 200 million pages of information. So uh, again, what we wanted to do is comparative analysis of uh, percutaneous access and closure with uh, one of the devices, so-called foreclosed device versus cut down. We wanted to make sure that we match those groups as far as all the important uh, uh, parameters are concerned, such as age, gender, uh, index type of procedure, the way the procedure, the, when the procedure was done, uh, baseline blood work to make sure how much of blood loss occurred, whether the patient needed blood transfusion post-procedure, and presence or absence of peripheral vascular disease. And then we also wanted to uh, perform multivariate regression controlled uh, analysis for baseline such as use of anticoagulants and uh, presence of atherosclerosis, malignancy, uh, uh, COPD, uh, history of MI, stroke and blood transfusion and many other variables that could influence the outcomes. And here is what we found using a logistic regression model uh, performed for uh, mortality and uh, morbidity. And we can see actually that there is a quite significant difference between cut down and use of perclose at 30 days, where perclose patients had 70% less likelihood to die at 30 days, which was absolutely amazing and remarkable. And also the hospitalization was for 43% shorter for Perkins patients and patients that uh, underwent uh, cut down. And this was uh, uh, published uh, in one of the journals. But you know, maybe one of the major difficulties that we had in publishing this manuscript, would you guess what was the reason for it? People thought you had a bias or that the patients weren't, complete, weren't randomized? Well, let me tell you, uh, interestingly enough, when we submitted this for the publication, some of the reviewers didn't even know that Watson, IBM Watson exists. Mm. Number two is they didn't realize that IBM Watson doesn't have a bias because it chooses the algorithms that are totally outside of scope of bias and, and can match the data more accurately than anybody else could do it in mm -hmm. that way. That was so lack of knowledge and lack of application on regular basis in research, education, and publication was the major deterrent actually to have this published. And then of course there was a skepticism, why would surgery be so inferior to percutaneous access and repair? You know, uh, one point about bias though, that, that's sort of true, but AI can have a bias because AI generates rules based on uh, the, the information you give it. And that's a, a big uh, point in AI is to avoid AI bias because the computer is rules-based and as it develops its algorithms, you can unintentionally cause the computer to develop its own biases. They're different than the biases that we as practitioners might have, but that's an active area of study and a, and a, and a lookout for the well, field. Bias will always exist because it basically depends on the input of data. Correct. For instance, if somebody labels a certain complication inaccurately, that data will be recorded as reliable. And if the information is not there, again, it cannot be used. So uh, yes, there is always a possibility of bias. bias. Meta-analysis could be full of bias as well, particularly when you mix studies that have a less than optimal information and database and small, uh, small set of uh, data, and you mix it with a large data that has a totally uh, different uh, information as far as reliability of the data is concerned. But anyhow, this just tells you that there are uh, many aspects as far as AI is concerned, but uh, 
in this particular scenario, I think it was very meaningful information. Now, another aspect uh, that is very important where AI plays a major role, and that's in the cardiovascular imaging. And uh, one of the example is uh, the Stanford University uh, mega computer and database that, that has been used for those uh, purposes. Stanford was one of the earliest to initiate uh, the project of AI in imaging. And they uh, used a cloud-based, uh, petabase scale uh, searchable repository of diagnostic imaging studies uh, for developing AI image analysis systems that would guide physicians in uh, interpretation of the imaging and also uh, as far as improvement in outcomes are concerned as well. Now, what's really important is that that data is available to anybody. For instance, like uh, related to a chest X-ray analysis, they gathered over, uh, well, close to a quarter million chest X-ray to be able to de determine and interpret various kinds of conditions that might be present on regular chest X-ray, and then to determine whether AI can accurately predict the diagnosis. Another one is from RSNA, as far as uh, chest X-ray uh, collected from NIH, and also RSNA as far as uh, CT brain, over 25,000 exams for diagnosis uh, and evaluation of uh, CT of the brain analysis. In echocardiography, over 10,000 echoes have been collected for that particular purpose, as well as lower extremity radiographic imaging and MRNet, all of those have been uh, uh, collected and are available for uh, uh, clinicians' uh, analysis and use. And as we can see, for instance, like in a chest X-ray interpretation of different pathologies, the correlation or sensitivity and specificity between expert interpretation and a computer or AI interpretation is very, very close, is very reliable. So we have achieved that goal in the fields of uh, chest X-ray and many other things that I have listed here. Here are those two typical examples of uh, what can happen when a patient with uh, coronary disease as far as indication for intervention is concerned. Here we have a patient A and we have a patient B. We have a CTA of the heart looking at a coronary artery anatomy, and we can see patient A on the left-hand side panel, upper panel, we can see there is a narrowing of the left anterior descending, there is a calcification, and we would estimate this, the stenosis is 70% uh, or so. Now, what is important and what we have available now, we know that from the interventional cardiology field that uh, fractional flow reserve is more reliable way of assessing the severity of disease and the outcome as far as uh, this uh, severity is concerned than just interpretation of uh, visual perception of severity of the disease. And we can see here in the middle upper panel that actually FFR is uh, 0.86, which is basically relatively normal flow. And also, as far as distal flow is concerned on the right-hand side, again, we can see that it's relatively normal flow. However, when we look in the pattern of a patient B in the lower panel, again, we can see that there is calcium and we can see that there is a narrowing in the LED that we would estimate again uh, to be 70% stenosis. But when we look at the FFR, then we can see that actually, uh, that there is a drop in uh, FFR in this particular scenario. So we can uh, therefore more accurately predict uh, the severity stenosis and the decrease in flow and the problems related uh, to the outcomes uh, as far as the risk of myocardial infarction and the need for intervention. So this is a very useful way of using uh, imaging to establish an uh, accurate diagnosis and to guide you in uh, what is the appropriate time to perform intervention. 
And in this particular scenario, using FFR with heart flow, we can see that the correlation was very good as far as diagnostic accuracy in concern in this particular clinical trial. So a lot of patients will avoid unnecessary procedures, operations, and even diagnostic cats. And so that's a great example of what AI and image processing can bring uh, to the population and to healthcare. Now let's go to uh, one of the examples where ultrasound it can be greatly used uh, in uh, diagnosis using artificial intelligence. Uh, one of them is this uh, GE venue with auto IVC uh, analysis. And another one is that you already have mentioned, DIA L Vivo EF that can actually assess uh, the ejection fraction from a handheld device and also uh, from Philips, so-called EPIC uh, uh, study uh, using AI, where we can assess peak systolic longitudinal strain just from the echocardiography. And uh, that will certainly have importance in uh, guiding the physician uh, as far as uh, any particular issues or concern might be related to any particular patient. Now, one of the issues uh, with uh, ultrasound imaging, particularly in echocardiography, is uh, unnatural hand-eye coordination that is required to perform imaging. So uh, it's uh, truly uh, unintuitive in a certain way because uh, whoever is performing the imaging has to look intermittently back and forth between the screen and the position of the probe. And that also is uh, complicated by a variety of issues that you might deal with with different patients, whether it's a different uh, patient's uh, body constitution or uh, due to, uh, let's say, uh, imaging of the heart in a patient that has a COPD where the imaging could be cumbersome. So how to come those over those obstacles? And obviously uh, AI uh, can assist and help in this particular scenario. And one of them is this caption AI that actually emulates the guidance of an expert sonographer by providing more than 90 types of real-time feedback uh, instructions during the procedure, how to position appropriately the probe, how to obtain the optimal image, and uh, when to obtain the optimal image. Actually, this particular software has so-called auto capture that automatically captures the image when it's optimally acquired. And uh, that can be achieved in multiple view and then the measurements can be obtained. And this was validated uh, in two uh, centers. Uh, and uh, as far as sensitivity uh, was concerned between the expert and the non-expert, obtaining the images using artificial intelligence was very good as we can see here for LV size, for LV function, RV size, uh, pericardial effusion. Uh, and uh, therefore this technique is very, very useful because it can be used uh, in the triage, for instance, in the emergency room, uh, in the field, uh, in the rural areas where uh, expert in echocardiography or ultrasonography is not present. I, I wanted to add, there's this other company uh, that's been out for a couple of years called Butterfly Network, and they're leveraging your iPhone. So the ultrasound beams the image to your phone, but it also leverages the camera. So it's show you're showing your hand and how you're holding it. And like you just showed, it's telling you how to change and move to capture the best images. And all these things are trying to democratize good ultrasonography. Because if we're gonna be able to provide quality care all over the world and all over our country to the uh, uh, rural areas, it's gonna be replacing technique with technology. And that's, isn't that one of the huge things that AI brings uh, into focus is the ability to leverage, leverage uh, artificial intelligence to do that. Another way, uh 
to uh, use AI is uh, in a transesophageal echocardiography, uh, which is typically performed by an expert in the field, where you can do a volume analysis, real-time 3D Doppler, 3D uh, valve analysis, which is very important during international procedures, such as valve procedures, TAVR, uh, mitral valve uh, repair, and, and so on. And we can see here, using AI systems, we can uh, demonstrate clearly uh, what the problem is and uh, how to address any particular issues that we might encounter during complex international procedures. One interesting thing as far as radiology is concerned, uh, all the technological advances that have occurred within the last decade or so related to the use of AI in reduction in radiation dose, in integration of imaging modalities, and improvement in image processing, all of those led to better, faster, safer, and more effective care and uh, better outcomes for our patients. And here are a few examples. Uh, this is one of the uh, MR applications where we have a MR scanner that uh, then uh, reconstructs uh, images in real time. And uh, you can use a AI algorithm uh, that uh, analyzes uh, the findings and establish uh, the proper uh, findings to uh, guide you in the diagnosis of any particular condition. Now, the great advantage of it is that uh, not only it can guide you as far as good acquisition during MR, but it also reduces the scan time from typical 90 minutes in complex scenarios to less than 15 minutes, which is uh, beneficial to the patient and beneficial to the individual that's performing the procedure and also individual that uh, is interpreting the procedure. Another important feature is uh, using uh, AI technology in image acquisition using so-called avatar system that can uh, identify patient's position on the x-ray table uh, for landmark detection, for the range detection, for the range adaptation over time, and uh, isocenter positioning, so you can obtain images in the most optimal way, and uh, patient direction analysis. It can identify head and toes, uh, position of the arms, and so on. And all of this can be achieved with advances uh, in uh, artificial intelligence and uh, computer analysis. And you know, that's gonna be very important uh, as you have seen more than most, the number of things we can do percutaneously is expanding geometrically with the uh, introduction of percutaneous valves, percutaneous repair of aortic aneurysms, percutaneous uh, interventions in the skull on aneurysms and clot uh, extraction. Uh, Medi, the stuff you guys are doing in the heart for electrophysiology. And so when you are navigating, uh, not blindly, you've got ultrasound, you've got fluoroscopy, but bringing AI in to help you make better decisions to do procedures in a shorter period of time and get better results, that's going to be huge. And there's a proliferation of new technology in that area as well. Zvanko, I think you use it extensively in aortic work, don't you? Right, right. Well, let me share with you some of the benefits of AI guidance for international procedures. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Mehdi, if you would be so kind uh, to talk a little bit uh, how uh, we internationalists can be helped using large bore sheets, avoiding serious life-threatening complications such as retroperitoneal bleed and uh, complications related to it. Uh, and uh, you're an inventor, you're a scientist, and you have this uh, amazing idea how to apply uh, existing technology to uh, this particular problem. So maybe you can comment a little bit about it. Sure, thank you. Um, so 
you know, in, in the image that you're showing, what we are doing is um, one of the major problems, uh, as uh, everyone here knows, is internal bleeding during the course of um, uh, these invasive procedures, especially when you're getting vascular access to the large bore um, arteries. And so uh, the this the technology that you are showing here basically it creates it, it introduces another variable if you will another dimension um, this specific technology is right now not being used with ai but the fact that there's another variable that's introduced in the decision making progress uh, process uh, actually uh, lends itself uh, to to uh, more uh, uh, precise uh, potentially even predictions of bleeding but what this system does uh, is it uh, is measuring uh, the impedance uh, of the tissue around the sheath in real time. And as uh, blood accumulates, blood has a very, very low impedance, probably the lowest of all biological uh, tissues. And so as blood accumulates uh, in the perivascular space, the impedance drops, and that's correlated uh, pretty nicely with the amount of blood that's um, extravasated. And you can uh, kind of imagine, without really trying that hard, that um, you know, as as the number of patients who are who have this uh, who uh, imaging and these sheets uh, utilized increases over time, uh, then you could uh, get to a stage where not only are you saying level one, level two, level three based on volume, but when level one happens, uh, perhaps you could actually predict: Is this patient now going to go to level two, level three? And so it's not only a warning that an event has occurred very early. Uh, in the process, but actually the next step with AI would be that I'm going to predict that an event will uh, occur or there's a very high likelihood of it. And therefore, can I actually do something to prevent the problem before it even happens? And that would be, uh, that would you know, obviously be very significant in the management of the patient. So what is the sensitivity and specificity of early bird in detecting It's Sure, it's, uh, it's, it's both the sensitivity and specificity are upwards of uh, 92%. Uh, and this is both in a series of preclinical and uh, clinical uh, studies. So it's, it's, it's quite high. And, uh, you know, if anything, the impedance uh, variables uh, can change, um, you know, uh, uh, very, very quickly. It's the first thing that we have noticed that uh, changes is the impedance before anything else of, of the variables itself. Um, and again, that nice correlation, that relatively um, robust sensitivity and specificity, we think potentially uh, down the road again could uh, be a very important uh, additional dimension uh, towards predicting uh, the bleeds. Thank you very much for this uh, very meaningful information. Um, another very important uh, advances as far as imaging is concerned, that is uh, <clears throat> very useful in my, uh, almost uh, everyday practice is uh, so-called fusion imaging. In case planning uh, during EVAR, TVAR, and TAVAR, by obtaining preoperative CTA, uh, which uh, then can uh, be corrected for uh, uh, parallax correction, uh, automated C-arm positioning, and also to assess uh, vessel origin, Obviously, this can then eliminate errors during the procedure and uh, also in pre-procedural situation offer uh, virtual uh, procedural planning. Here are some of the examples we can see of the use of uh, CT images uh, prior to the procedure and then fusing it with the images on the right-hand side uh, during the procedure where we can uh, identify clearly the position of the renal ostia or origin of internal iliac arteries or any other vessels of importance uh, uh, during EVAR or, or TVAR, which is extremely helpful because this way we can save time, save amount of contrast that we use and uh, perform the procedure in safer and more reliable way. One of very exciting fields uh, is so-called uh, force uh, imaging or fiber optic real shape uh, imaging during uh, EVAR that has been introduced uh, by Philips. And uh, it uses a fiber optic uh, uh, technique uh, in a catheter where actually this is achieved with a fusion 
of the CT images, uh, which is obtained prior to the procedure, and then uh, uh, imaging just with the fluoroscopy during the procedure, where actually by uh, uh, looking again, optical impedance, this uh, fiber that is in the catheter can guide uh, the catheter without any difficulties to uh, the desired location. As we can see here, marking with the ring the origin of uh, the renal arteries and then also easily cannulating with the force technique uh, the contralateral gate of the stent graft and deploying the stent graft in desired location. And we can see at the completion angiogram excellent results in this complex anatomy, perfect placement of the stent graft and significantly shorter procedure than it would otherwise be the case if we would not have this technology available. Another exciting field is again with Philips and uh, also Microsoft uh, partnering is uh, holographic uh, imaging uh, during interventional procedures uh, such as EVAR or uh, TVAR procedures are concerned where we can see that uh, the individual that's performing the procedure has in front of him uh, all the uh, tools that are necessary in manipulating the image and manipulating the devices uh, during the procedure. Now, uh, there is a very broad potential, not only in uh, what I do, EVAR, TVAR, and TAVARs, but in many other areas where uh, holographic uh, imaging can be used. And uh, just recently, uh, I have seen uh, this being used uh, in the field of electrophysiology. So maybe, maybe you can comment a little bit about it. Sure. So, so um, what has been done is using the, you know, uh, the, the uh, holographic imaging, um, what can actually be done is you can actually, just by the manipulation of, of the images itself, you can actually significantly, you know, probably like by a factor of, you know, five or so, uh, decrease uh, the number uh, of ablations that, that are delivered. And, and you know, um, unfortunately in the field of EP, there's kind of a, a, a saying that, uh, um, you know, with a little bit of an edge to it, it says learning as you're burning. And, and the fact is that, you know, a lot of times you uh, deliver lesions in a blade in different areas looking for a specific uh, outcome of termination of an arrhythmia or whatever uh, other variable that is of interest. And so, as, as you, but of course, delivering those lesions does have uh, effect on the underlying substrate. You, know, you don't want to burn tissue if you, if you don't have to. With the holographic imaging, you actually are much more precise, uh, at least in this, this was a limited study, but uh, in the number of uh, lesions uh, that are required to be delivered. And so um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, uh, you know, that's a very significant improvement uh, in, in, in what our patients uh, uh, undergo in terms of the uh, extent of ablation um, exposure. You know, uh, this is an interesting question you raise. Is there a risk for cardiologists, radiologists, and echo specialists to replace by AI in the near future? And uh, there, there is no risk. We will always need domain experts to take care of these critically ill patients. Uh, AI is a tool like any other tool, and if you don't learn to use it, you, you, you do that at your peril. Very good. What about uh, cardiovascular surgery, Billy? What is your uh, opinion the use yeah. of AI in this field? Yeah, I think so. Uh, decision support, I mean, AI is critical. And we're already sort of doing that. We have scoring systems to decide who to operate on and who not to and who's likely to require different things. But once, once we start, uh, acquiring big data and doing big analytics, we'll be able to do that with much greater accuracy. Here's some great examples of robotics in surgery. And really, the, by the true definition of robot, none of these, well, 
some of these have aspects of robotics, but the Da Vinci surgical uh, system, the one that most people identify as a surgical robot, is not a robot. There is no autonomy. It is a telesurgery, meaning the surgeon makes all the decisions, does all the moves. If the surgeon wants to do something very ill-advised, the robot will let them. That said, we are right on the cusp of that changing. And you may know that Johnson & Johnson did a large uh, interaction with uh, Google to create Verb Robotics. And now Verb Robotics is sort of uh, being folded into RS Robotics. It's a complex, a lot of big pieces moving on the Johnson Johnson board. But other big companies as well are saying, how can we give some element of intelligence uh, uh, to surgical robotic systems? Again, historically, it's just been a tool. It does make smaller incisions and you can be incredibly precise in the visualization, the 3D visualization through the robotic uh, uh, console is amazing. But what if, and, and this, is, this was the hypothesis, if we actually looked at and deeply analyzed the thousand or 2000 robotic procedures done every day in the United States and in Europe, and glean key insights and then use those while we're watching a live surgery go prospectively, could we give insights to that surgeon that can make them better, faster, safer? That's an unknown question right now. Will surgeons, will their first uh, actionable item say, turn that off or will they listen? Who knows? It's certainly gonna have an impact on training surgeons though to do robotics. Um, and we're seeing that already. Why, what's good about robotic surgery? Well, the obvious advance of not opening you up, not spreading, uh, it's much less morbid, post-op pain's better, you get up and around quicker, but it takes a lot of training for the surgeon and a very dedicated team. That said, there are teams around the country that are doing a brilliant job with lobectomy, with mitral surgery, very few people are doing coronary surgery with it, but there are some advances, advantages to robotics other than the small incision. First of all, your view. You have this beautiful 3D camera that you can put very, very close to what you're looking at. And so in the console, you have this beautiful three-dimensional view that's much better than what you see during open surgery. And if you've got a bit of a tremor, you can take that tremor out. And if you stop and leave your instrument, your instruments will stay exactly where you put them. Uh, so these surgical systems are are brilliantly designed and uh, for those teams that have learned to use them, they can get great results. That said, only three to 5% of surgeries are done robotically now. So it's been a wonderful evolution of technology, but it hasn't had epidemiological impact yet. They don't have them in the third world, they don't have them in rural centers. And so the next big step in robotics is coming up with ways that it can be uh, uh, globalized. And hopefully that's what's going on now with the big robotic uh, organizations. Now there's a lot of uh, technology that allow you to use robots in intervascular interventions. These again are not robotic. You are controlling them yourselves. One of the big ones is uh, Magellan. Uh, Zvanko, you're gonna talk about that. And I think we're also gonna talk about Corindus. But uh, Auris is a robotic bronchoscope, and you want to tell us about Magellan. That's a fascinating platform. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I think this was uh, very informational. Uh, we are just at the very beginning uh, using uh, robotics in, uh, well, cardiovascular surgery and uh, endovascular interventions. And here are a few of the examples, uh, like Magellan uh, Robotics can be used to uh, enter uh, into very complex uh, anatomy, such as uh, complex uh, renal artery origin, uh, uh, occlusion of the internal iliac arteries for a variety of reasons. Uh, this can certainly uh, simplify the procedure and make the procedure shorter and uh, more reliable. One uh, <clears throat> particular technology that's uh, very exciting and has been existing for a while, it was relatively recently actually acquired by Siemens, is CorePath by Corindus. And uh, this has been used uh, extensively uh, abroad and less here in the United States in coronary interventions, but also in peripheral 
vascular interventions. And here we have an example of a cardiologist in India actually uh, performing the procedure remotely from uh, uh, one town to another town where he has a less experienced cardiologist just placing catheters and wires. And once they are placed there, then uh, this particular cardiologist, interventional cardiologist remotely uh, is advancing the wires, balloons, and stents. And actually he performed uh, in less than uh, five hours, five different interventional procedures with excellent outcomes. Now for us here in the United States, uh, this is uh, still an issue and uh, we will discuss this a little bit more in detail later, but one of the major issues is uh, uh, credentialing for that. And there is also uh, liability issues that we have to take into consideration. And uh, what if complications occur? Who's going to uh, uh, resolve those complex, uh, complex scenarios if the interventionalist is not present. Uh, Marco, let me ask you a question because, you know, we keep saying robotics and, and that's the conventional term for these type of systems, but a robot is supposed to cognate, it's supposed to be thinking, it's supposed to self-correct, it's supposed to learn. These systems do none of those. It's a person driving, and if that person wants to drive something to the wrong position, the robot, the robot says, yeah, do it. There is no AI, there's no learning, there's no insight. But those things we've seen in other venues, self-driving cars, the car is looking at everything, doing threat analysis, looking at pedestrians. It's amazing. That is true AI. How long before we have a robot, do you think, that you can actually do access and say, go out, get in the left corner. And you would cross your arms and it would navigate. It would watch where the wire was going. It would wait until it was down the left main. And then you could say, now go selective into the LAD and get that first diagonal. Is that an unimaginable future state or is that coming? And if it came, how, how would you accept it as a clinician? Well, uh, we know that AI is uh, trying to uh, mimic the cognitive function of humans, basically using uh, the same process of thinking, using logic, using common sense, uh, and figuring out and solving problems in the most effective way. And as you mentioned, this already exists, this technology exists in uh, driverless cars and so on. Uh, are we there yet in uh, medicine, in cardiovascular medicine? We are not. But what we are showing here, this is early stages of using computers to uh, help and facilitate the process of uh, whatever we do, whether it's for diagnostic purposes or interventional purposes, like in this particular scenario. There is a software that's uh, dedicated to that particular purpose. And uh, uh, there is a certain reliability and sensitivity of that software that uh, is very important in being able to achieve those procedures. It's not just the movement of devices, catheters or balloons or surgical instruments, but uh, it will uh, also give you a control to prevent certain untoward effects if that is uh, implemented in that particular software. And this is where we have to work on. And this is where actually simulation has to play a role. Uh, and we will talk about it uh, shortly, but a simulation is certainly important and we know in aviation industry. And yeah. without simulation, we would not be able to have uh, reliability and safety that we have in aviation industry because uh, the pilot, fully depends on AI or the computer on the plane to be able to safely guide the plane to certain destination sure. and uh, do it in the most effective way. And threat avoidance. You know, Mehdi, I want to ask you the same question. If you had something that you said, okay, go get transeptal access and you stood back and it did it. And then you said, go ahead and map the whole left atrium and it did it. And then you said, do a pulmonary vein isolation and it would do it. Would that 
would you embrace that? Or do you think there's just no way it could do it as good as you? Because we no, do. I, I, I think that it, it, it will be able to do it as good as me and someday perhaps uh, better. Even right now, um, we have some technologies actually, you know, your, to your own company, the Biosense Webster, where we are trying, for example, something called pace mapping that we do all the time in our procedures, where you pace from a specific region and you look at the morphology of the pace impulse you know, on the 12 lead ECG and you compare it to the clinical BT or, you know, PVC morphology that you have that you're trying to chase. And what we do is we try to give it a score. We say, okay, this, this paste morphology, when I paste from this spot, it looks 80% similar, 90% similar, 100% similar to what I know is my target clinical based on an EKG that I have, you know, collected. And the, 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 the system, in your case, the Cardo Biosense uh, system, uh, Biosense Webster system, tells me 97 versus 96 versus 95%. And this morning, just before we came here, I had a case that I used that specific precision uh, that, 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 that the technology offered me to actually successfully ablate uh, in a case that otherwise probably would have been extremely challenging and likely it wouldn't have worked. Um, I don't feel threatened by it. In this case, it enabled it. And I think that, um, yeah, in, in other situations, if, if it increases the, you know, the safety for the patient, again, another example is contact force measurement, again, from the tip of the ablation catheters. It tells you you're pressing too hard. You're not pressing hard enough. Uh, you know, it, it, if it makes the patient's outcomes better, um, I don't think that the physicians should ever be uh, threatened by that. It's, it's basically saying, you know, some of these eventually AI to me will be as if it's saying I have the experience of 2 million cases, something I as a physician will never have. And so uh, I embrace it. I'm going to work with it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm going to find more uh, innovative things for myself in, in terms of, you know, trying to uh, push forward the science in the field. So, yeah. Great. So, uh, you know, I, I think when you look at the role that AI is going to play in cardiovascular medicine in the future, it's just going to be greater and greater. Uh, the slope of discovery is exponential. So, which means in the last five years, we progressed like we did in the previous 10 years. And that 10 years was very similar to the previous 20 years. Things are changing so quickly and pieces of the puzzle like Serranus, like force contact, like you just said, uh, mapping for ectopic foci, all that, all that sensor, computer-aided sensor stuff is now input into this big, giant AI data uh, uh, resource that's going to allow us to really understand what the future looks like for any given patient and to be able to do that anywhere in the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, I think it's, it's coming and it's coming fast. Uh, I think, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ray, Ray Kurzweil said it's coming in 2027 which is only seven years from now, but exponential, who knows? Well, uh, <clears throat> I certainly hope it will happen that fast. But uh, here is a, a relatively uh, simple presentation of um, schematic uh, scenario, what could potentially happen as far as AI is concerned in cardiovascular medicine. Of course, one of the most important uh, big data that we have is EMR. And uh, the issues that we have with EMR at the present time is that they don't necessarily talk to each other. So we, we definitely need standardization as far as EMR is concerned, because for data mining, we need EMR to be able to uh, get all the information that is pertinent to certain disease, certain patients uh, and then use that information in the best uh, way to be able to uh, add to other components such as imaging that we talked about and then implementing artificial uh, intelligence algorithms using cognitive computing, using uh, deep learning and uh, machine learning to uh, advance uh, whatever we do in cardiovascular medicine, whether it's in physician uh, in training, education, whether it's uh, physicians that are in remote locations to guide them and help them in complex procedures where they don't have access to all the technology that we normally have in 
very sophisticated medical centers. Uh, and also what's very important for endovascular specialists that would like to gain additional expertise or recredentialing for their procedures. Now, as far as physicians and in training are concerned, it's important uh, that they undergo supervised learning. But before they actually get involved in any interventional complex procedures, they should be able to uh, uh, pass the test of simulation uh, and then uh, lead to a hands-on. And simulation, even though it exists for several decades, is still in very primitive and uh, rudimentary way uh, existing at the present time. And the reason for it is that it's basically driven by industry needs to uh, promote their product, but it's not designed in a true sense for uh, extensive educational purposes. And what I mean by that is uh, that simulation in cardiovascular field does not have all the components that exist, for instance, in aviation industry, where the pilots in training going through simulation have a variety of options how to deal with certain complexities, whether it's a loss of engine control, loss of hydraulics, uh, whether it's fire, whether it's a sudden drop uh, in the plane uh, altitude for whatever reason, uh, or a hydraulic failure of any kind and so on. We do not have that in our education. And that is something that needs to be developed uh, and used uh, more extensively for better patient care. And then, as I mentioned, remote procedural guidance, it exists to a certain degree, but in a very uh, primitive uh, way. And particularly nowadays, with uh, we live in a COVID era, God knows for how long, and it's almost uh, impossible to organize courses with hands-on experience from physic physicians coming to institutions uh, uh, with symbols of excellence to uh, train them in the procedure. So remote guidance will be extremely, extremely important, and we have to explore into that field using artificial intelligence. And again, credentialing and recredentialing is another aspect, particularly now uh, where we have to do it uh, in our own institution with some kind of uh, remote guidance. And all of it, I have no doubt, with the use of artificial intelligence will lead to improved patient care and better outcomes. You know, that's one of the things I've heard that's gonna be a big indication for things like Watson, IBM, or anything that can parse human speech is taking over the whole oral examination field. Because now you can sit down with an examiner and if they've had a bad day or they have some bias, they don't like the way you look, that can change the way the whole thing goes. Or they can just fortunately take you just into superficial stuff you know or take you very deeply into stuff you don't know. It's very capricious, the outcome of an oral exam not with leveraging AI and uh, natural language parsing. And so they think they'll be able to objectify that. Uh, so you've said challenges in AI medicine. There are, there are a lot of them. And uh, let, let's go through those because I think that's a hot, hot so area. We, we already touched uh, uh, on some of them. And not only in the cardiology, not only in the international field, but also in the cardiovascular and vascular surgery. But one of the greatest challenges in the present time is truly data integration. And I mentioned uh, as far as uh, EMR uh, data is concerned, also imaging data is concerned, and how to integrate in a clinical flow is, is still a challenge for most Although, part. you know, when we're talking AI, there's weak AI and there's strong AI. And those are terms used in AI. Weak AI is very rules-based, simple task. If you wanted to integrate data, you could use weak AI. Strong AI uses the ability to present, uh, to uh, face problems that it hasn't been prepped for. So strong AI, you don't need to integrate the data. It'll sit down, it'll comb through it, it'll make sense out of it and put it in the format that it likes. And that's coming very, very soon. 
So trying to get EMRs to talk to each other may be something that we don't need to worry about because very soon the AI will be able to navigate a totally unfamiliar data set with totally unfamiliar data fields, parsing natural human speech, we'll be able to make sense out of it and put it in a, a, you know, the idea of somebody having to input data just right will be a problem of the past. Absolutely correct. And that leads to this point of interpretation, understanding uh, machine learning models. Actually, machine learning is becoming so sophisticated that the computers and the software and algorithms can already predict what is the best and what is the op most optimal way to analyze the data. But obviously, we have to make sure that we are using the most appropriate algorithms and that we are inputting the data that is essential. And we have to be able to uh, create machine learning models. They are only as good as the training data. And uh, you mentioned, uh, Billy, that already. Uh, we have to make sure that the appropriate and the most important data is included and uh, that that data is used in the best and most optimal way. Now, what's also very important is, uh, uh, of course, uh, no uh, computers are perfect. No uh, machine learning or AI algorithms are perfect. And a my misdiagnosis can occur. And again, that is obviously related to not understanding machine learning models and not being able to uh, uh, put a good quality training data in those machine learning models. So we always have to carefully analyze the data and to uh, see if there was any bias, either by the operator that included that data in analysis or by that particular AI algorithm that uh, led to misdiagnosis. And you know, one of the challenges, if I, if I may, uh, with that is that there's two different kinds of AI. There's supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, which is strong AI, it comes up, it digs deep into the data and makes its own associations. You don't, you don't control that. So it may come up with correlations and insights that we've always missed. The problem with that is, how it came about its decisions is opaque to you. They call that black box AI. And in the banking industry, for example, um, when someone applies for credit or a loan, if you turn them down, you have to be able to say why. It can't be just, I just don't like you. When, you, when they brought AI into the banking business, sometimes there'll be something that everybody assumed they would get, and the, and the AI says, no, this is not a good loan, we're not gonna give them credit and you kind of try to query the AI and say why, and you can't find it. So you may get some bad diagnoses, and studying those may teach us a lot about AI, that aren't such bad diagnoses. We think they're bad diagnoses, but the computer had insights that we couldn't follow because it was, you know, black box AI, you keep, uh, mining insights that we don't have. And finally, we have regulatory challenges, which are always challenges in regardless of what we do in cardiovascular medicine and we have to be able to uh, convince uh, regulatory agencies to work with us on a new AI models and uh, how to implement them in the most uh, appropriate way. There are also social and legal implications and we talked about malpractice in remote proctoring or remote uh, performance of the procedures uh, that will happen in the future and that has to be uh, that has to be addressed uh, which has not been resolved for most part uh, particularly not in the united states so those, those are the issue of major concern that will uh, slow down the whole process of implementation of ai in cardiovascular medicine because i wanted to end this program on a very optimistic uh, note, and I am quoting uh, Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google, who stated that AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on. It is more profound, he says, than electricity or fire. So that's true optimism, and I hope it materializes. Uh, that's a great, great quote to end on. Electricity, yeah, fire. 
No. Very good. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to join me uh, for another educational program uh, at Texas Heart Institute on Innovative Technologies and Techniques. Uh, it was a pleasure discussing this uh, subject with you. Thank you, Svanko. See you, man. Thank you. Thank you again.